if I'm smart and hardworking and I can crank out for 70 hours a week and you do it for 30, it's like in two years, I'm so far ahead of you, you will never ever catch up. If you concentrate solely on your career, you can get a long way in your career. And I would say that that's a strategy that a minority of men preferentially do. That, that's all they do. They work like 70, 80 hours a week. They go flat out on their career. They're staking everything on the small probability of exceptional status in a narrow domain. But it's, it's hard on them. They don't have a life. It's very difficult for them to have a family. They don't know how to take any leisure activity, like they get very one-dimensional. Now, it may be that that unidimensionality is the price you have to pay to be exceptional at one thing, right? Because if you're going to be something like a genius level mathematician, and you want to do that for, or a scientist say, it's like, you're in your lab, you're in your lab all the time, you're working 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week, you're smart, you're dedicated, you're unidimensional, and that's how you get to beat all the other people who are doing that. It's the only way. But the problem is you don't get a life. Now, if you love being a scientist and you have that kind of focus of mind, well, first of all, you're a rare person, and second, you're gonna pay for it. But fine, more power to you. But it's a risky business to do that. You sacrifice a lot for it. You know, and I would say most often, if you're speaking about having a healthy life, that isn't what you do. You spread yourself out more. So, you know, you have a family, you have some things that you do outside of work that are meaningful to you and useful. You, you have a network of friends. Those three things alone are plenty to keep you well oriented. And then if one of those things collapses, you know, everything doesn't go. Now, the, the price you pay for that is the more you strive to optimize that balance, the less likely you are to be fantastically successful at any single one of them. But you might have a very, you know, if you con consider your life as a whole, that might be a winning strategy. Men went after perfection and win women went after wholeness. So they're different, they're different. There's something different at the top of the value hierarchy. So perfection would be stake it all on one thing and, and look for radical success. Not, all, not that all men do that, because they don't, but we're, we're talking about extremes, at, at least with the regards to the men that do that. The wholeness idea is more like, well, I want, it's like I want one thing in my life to be 150%, or I want five things in my life to be 80%. Well, there, there's a lot more richness in a life where you have five things operating at 80%, but you're not operating in any of, at any of them at 150%. So, and I really believe this because I've watched men and women go through their careers now for a long period of time. And one of the things that, there's lots of things that produce this, but one of the things that I've noticed is that mostly women in their 30s bear, bail out of unidimensional careers. They won't do them. They won't, they won't put in the 80 hours a week that they would have to put in in order to dominate that particular area. And it isn't, the reason that they won't do it is because they decide it's not worth it. And no wonder because why would that be worth it? You, you have to ask yourself that. It's like, well, you want to be an outstanding scientist. It's like, okay, really, really, that's what you want. Because that means that's what you do. Because you're competing with other people. You know, they're smart, they're hardworking. And if you want to be at the top, you have to be smarter and work harder than any of them. And working hard means working long hours. I mean, it also means working diligently, but in, in the final analysis, it's all, also an additive issue. If I'm smart and hardworking and I can crank out for 70 hours a week and you do it for 30, it's like in two years, I'm so far ahead of you, you will never ever catch up. And the way it works is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal. Okay, well, what's the implication of that? Better have a valued goal because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal, in principle, the more the microprocesses associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. And so what that means is, well, you get up in the morning and you're excited about the day, you're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal. Maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding, because that's also useful. You specify your goal, you, you do that in s some sense as a unique individual, you want to you want to specify goals that make you say, oh, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. Because the question always is, why do something? 
Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and you don't do anything. That's real easy. The question is, why would you ever do anything? And the answer to that has to be because you've determined by some means that it's worthwhile. And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. And the other would be, well, you kind of look at how, look at what it is that people accrue that's valuable across the lifespan. So you do a structural analysis of the subcomponents of human existence. You need a family, you need friends. Like you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, plans for, you know, time outside of work, uh, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. You know, those are that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, well, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's that's a bad that's a bad deal for you. So once you, but once you set up that, that goal structure, let's say, and that's really, in many, in many ways, that's what you should be doing at university. Is, is, that's exactly what you should be doing, is trying to figure out who it is that you're trying to be, right? And you, you, you aim at that. And then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And, and I really mean want to be. I don't mean should be, even those things, those things are going to overlap. And it's important to distinguish between those because that's partly, and this is back down to the micro routine analysis. So if I was saying, well, you're gonna to try to make yourself more industrious. Okay, number one, specify your damn goals. Because how are you gonna hit something if you don't know what it is? That isn't gonna happen. And often people won't specify their goals too because they don't like to specify conditions for failure. So if you keep yourself all vague and foggy, which is real easy, because that's just a matter of not doing as well, then you don't know when you fail. And people might say, well, I really don't want to know when I fail because that's painful. So I'll, I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. So, so I would recommend that you don't let that happen. So that's willful blindness, right? You could have known, but you chose not to. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, looks like that might be worth living, despite the fact that it's going to be, you know, anxiety provoking and threatening and there's going to be some suffering and loss involved and all of that. Obviously, the goal is to, to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Okay, so then what do you do? Well, then, then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with the schedule? It's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. Well, it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want.